All right. Hey, gang, good morning. Welcome back. So, trying to think. Let's get started here. I'll, I'll switch over and then we can, we can think together. Yesterday, we technically finished up the material that's going to be on exam one. Um, I do want to look at some slightly deeper cases. Um, there's a little bit more to the chain rule. Not necessarily in that, in that you haven't seen the full theorem, but um, just, you know, some applications and things that might, might be a little bit surprising, not 100% super intuitive. But really, really, we've seen everything we need. Um, today's what, the fourth, the fifth? Uh, the fifth, yeah. All right. Okay, so first, uh, a couple of announcements. Um, I am going to have to cancel today's office hour because I'm in the middle of moving. Where is this? Come on. Focus, you fuck. All right. Sorry about this. Um, if you're intending to come to today's office hour to ask me some questions, uh, please just send me a, a Canvas message or an email with those questions, and I will get to them. Um, but right now, I've... Uh, I got to be out of my current apartment by tomorrow, and um, and I, I need this time to move, unfortunately. So today's office hour is is canceled. I'll hold an extra office hour next week to make up for it, but I know that's not the same thing. So if you're on a particular time crunch, um, I'll be checking my email at the end of the day, and I'll make sure I clear out any questions that come in. So if there were questions you wanted to ask um, in office hours today, please um, just send them send them by a Canvas message. Um, remember, exam one is next week. For your section, we said next Wednesday, right? You know. And the guide is up, I think, in Canvas. Pretty sure we've got that announcement up here explaining everything. Mm -hmm. So please, please. Uh, oh, no, let's see. This is the study guide. All right. Uh, Okay, so I'll make an announcement with instructions for exam one. It's not super complicated, but you are going to need to sign into Zoom on your phones. So make sure that you have, I'll come over here. Download Zoom on your phone. Um, make sure honor lock, the honor lock extension. for Chrome on your laptop or your computer, whatever sort of computer you're using. Um, what else is there we need to do for this? I think this, this is mostly it, right? So make sure uh, your, <clears throat> your laptop or your computer is ready to rock and roll with Honor Lock. That means you've got a working webcam um, and that Chrome is itself up to date because on a lot can sometimes cause issues with older versions of Chrome. Uh, make sure Zoom is working on your phone. Make sure you're able to navigate to Canvas on your phone. Um, the Canvas student app is not that bad. Uh, it is it is workable. I would I would recommend installing that. Um, but if if you don't like the Canvas app on your phone, I understand. Just make sure that you can get to Canvas on your phone's browser that you know how to do that because you're going to have to follow a link um, from a Canvas announcement to open the Zoom meeting on your phone um, next Wednesday for the test. Um, Luke asked a good question. How many questions are going to be on the test? I think 14 questions. Uh, I haven't, haven't finished writing the test yet, but I'm pretty sure we're going to kind of settle at 14 questions. Uh, there will be three or four true-false, three or four multiple choice, and then the remainder will be free response. Um, the God damn it, this thing. The uh, true false are going to be worth four points. The multiple choice are going to be worth six points. And the free response are going to be worth 10 points. Ah. 10 points. Um, 
So it's, most of the points will come from the uh, free response, but you don't want to overlook the true, false, and multiple choice either. Um, they can be a little bit tricky. So take your time, read carefully, think critically. But yeah, 14 questions. What else do I need? Is there anything else announcement -y like this? Um, study guide one, uh, instructions for the study guide. So I'll, I'll be uh, posting instructions for the exam, but instructions for study guide one are up in Canvas. Please follow these. I think that's about it as far as announcements are concerned. Okay. That's to Professor? Yeah, sure. Adrian, what's up? As soon as we finish taking the test, do you want us to like immediately send um, a picture of the um, scratch work that we had to you through Canvas? So it, it should be like yeah. five, 10 minutes max, like after you can do the test. That's the idea. Yeah. So there's a, I'm going to have a 15 minute flag on there. If you submit, so here's how it works, right? You're going to click this link to take the test. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as you finish that, you're going to come back and click um, the link to submit your, your written work. Um, and there's going to be a flag on there. If you submit the written work more than 15 minutes after you finish the test, I'll get a little notification. Um, and then you'll have to explain that to me. So yeah, I, I want you to submit the written work for the exam within 15 minutes of finishing the test itself, preferably less. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure. And it's a simple process. Um, I'm not going to restrict file types. I used to restrict file types to PDFs. I'm not that picky. Um, but I, I just, I just want to see your work. Um, and I want to know that it's the work that you did during the test. There is one thing worth mentioning here. It's very important that you don't forget to write your answers in the test itself. Right. So each one of those free response questions is going to have a little box for you to type your final answer. You need to do that. If you don't type your final answer in the box on the test, I can't give you credit. So I need to be able to compare the answer you type in the test to the thing you write down on the page. Um, Trevor asks, will the true false questions usually be about definitions? Um, sort of, yeah, like continuity, definition of continuity or definition of differentiability. Those sort of things can show up there. Um, I rewrite these every semester, so I'm not uncomfortable sharing with you a, an old Calc 1 test. Let's see here. This is going to go way back to spring 17. This will definitely look plenty different. All right, so here is, um, here's an example of my exam 1 from Calc 1 uh, from several years ago. Uh, so true or false, this thing has a removable discontinuity at negative 2, or you know, true or false, this inequality is sufficient to get the limit here. At zero to be two, true or false? This limit is one. That sort of stuff. Um, you know, if f is continuous, then f is differentiable. These sort of things. So they do. Yeah, they tend to have to do with definitions and concepts. So I'm going to post some pretty specific instructions for how I want your um, your written work to be. But yeah, basically just. You know, name at the top, problem number, and then your work. Um, and then we'll do one problem per page, please, um, or one problem per side of the paper. And that way we can keep everything nice and organized. For the free responses, uh, do we have to like simplify all the way through or could we just like leave it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so you, you've noticed in classes, I work examples. I'll say like, you could stop here, this would be okay. Um, same guidelines apply for you guys. So if the problem is just find this derivative or whatever, as soon as you have that derivative, um, I, you don't need to simplify further. Unless the problem explicitly states you need to get the for answer into one form or another, um, then you don't need to stress. Okay, thank you. All right. I know it's tempting to, um, to talk about the test in these kind of uh, distanced ways like just talking about talking about the test but i think the best thing we could do is look at some problems and there are some problem types that we haven't been able to play with just yet um namely there are a few limits like these that you guys have been looking at um that i want to spend a, a little bit of time playing with um kind of weird trig limits and then there are also some chain rule problems that i would like to look at that i don't think you guys have have had the time to really play with yet so 
Um, where were those? There's one or two of those. Yeah, okay. So, um, some starting here by saying recall the special trig limits. All right, so uh, let's damp him. So this guy, sine x over x, as x goes towards zero, this one was one. And this guy, cos x minus one over x, as x goes towards zero, this is zero. These are our two special trig limits. Uh, and there are some problems in your homework for this week that have you working with um, limits that look a little bit like these. So limits like the ones you saw here. And I want to look at just one or two problems of this nature um, to see to, to, to show you a little bit how, how these can be done nicely. Um, I'll take number 39 here to start, sine 5x over 3x as x goes to 0. Uh, these can be used to calculate other limits, for example. Lim x to zero was it sine five x over three x here? So this is kind of similar to the sine x over x limit, right? Only instead of an x inside here, I have a five x, and instead of an x downstairs here, I have a three x. Um, what I would like to do is somehow make this thing show up here. And the first thing I would do towards that end uh, is to pop this three out, right? This is the same as lim x to zero sine of five x over x times one third, right? This three is this three. It was downstairs. Sony comes out of this big fraction. He's going to come out as a one third. Now, unfortunately, I can't do anything like that with the five. The five here is trapped inside this sine function. And, and uh, depending on who you took trig with, um, you may have used different language. But the basic idea is that these numbers and things that are trapped inside these trig functions, they can't come out, right? Trig function is kind of like a box from which there is no escape. Um, unless you use some sort of special identity, but there is no like, you know, uh, multiply by five angle identity for the sine function. So there's no getting this five out. That's not gonna happen. But if I want to make use of this fact, I could try introducing a five downstairs. Let me answer that in just a second, Luke. So my next step here would be to introduce a five downstairs. That way the thing downstairs looks like the thing inside the sine function. So if I want to make this sine five X over five X, I've still got my one third over here. What I'm really doing is adding a factor of five downstairs. I can do that as long as I add a factor of five upstairs. So purely in terms of algebra, this is the same as this. And now we can make a little substitution. I could say let uh, z be 5x and note that as x goes to 0, z goes to 0 too. So my lim x to zero, blah, 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 can be replaced by lim z to zero. And then each one of those pieces, I just have to replace with its equivalent. So sine five x, okay, well, z is five x. So that's gonna be sine z 
And downstairs there, I have 5x. OK, well, that's the z. And then I still have this 5 over 3 hanging out over here. OK, well, all these pens are dying. And now the miracle is that sine z over z, as z goes to 0, this really is the same as sine x over x, as x goes to 0. So the limit piece here is going to go to 1. And the 5 thirds is just going to hang around. So we get 1 times 5 thirds, which is 5 thirds. And all of these kind of weird limits, they work the same way. Um, you need to, if you have a tangent, you need to split it up as sines and cosines. Uh, and if you have some variation of you know, numbers inside here or numbers down here, you need to juggle things around until you've got sine of something over that same thing. Then you can make a substitution for the inside of the sine function and rewrite it in a way that you can you can really prove that this is equal to one because we know that this is equal to one how did we get 5x in the bottom again so at this step right here yes i multiplied by five downstairs and by five upstairs so i'm multiplying by five over five which is sneaky so um, is it uh, uh, is it just like easier for you to see that it's 5x or 5x you write them to z or can you also i mean when it's sine 5x over 5x you can just make that one right because it's the same as sine z over z you can say that the limit as x goes to zero of sine 5x over 5x is one yeah if you wanted to conclude from this line that this limit is one that the blue box here is one I would be okay with that. But the way it's normally taught and the way your textbook does it is they say you should make a little substitution here. Um, what matters is that okay. the inside of the sine function is going to zero and the thing downstairs is the same as the thing inside the sine function. So as long as these match and the thing inside is also going to zero, that's really the purpose of this step is to acknowledge that as X goes to zero, 5x also goes to zero. So this really is like sine of theta over theta as theta goes to zero, um, or sine of z over z as z goes to zero. Um, in other words, if this was like sine of e to the x over e to the x, that would not work, right? Because e to the x does not go to zero as x goes to zero, it goes to one. Right. So that would be like sine one over one. But if it's a multiple of x and you wanted to conclude from this line right here that the limit was one, I would be okay with that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say you're being incorrect or being lazy there. Um, but most people find it a little easier to digest just to see this thing looking exactly like this thing. Um, and either way is all right with me. I wanna okay. make real clear where the fives were coming from. So there's a couple questions in chat. Imagine at this line right here, the previous line, I multiplied by five over five. All these fractions are, are being multiplied. So I can shove any one piece any place I want. Just like I can bring this three out as a one third, I can bring this five in right here. And that's where he came from. And the other five, he stayed out. I just bring him over here. And since five over five is one, right? Multiplying by five over five really didn't change the value of the expression. So it's a, it's an algebra uh, trick here. Kind of think of it as similar to like what you do when you wanna have a common denominator. I really wanted a five X down here. So in order to introduce that five, I multiplied by a five upstairs and downstairs. And then I just grouped the term, the five downstairs, I put here with the X, the five upstairs, I put over here with the one third. Is there a pattern like sine five X over three X and there's gonna be five over three, or is this just for that problem? Ah, so this is a good question. In general, Can we figure out what this should do? A over B. Oh, 
How would we prove it? I would need to have sine AX over AX because that piece would go to one, right? Yeah. So if I multiply by A over A, and then I shuffle the A's and B's around down here, which is kosher because this is multiplication, right? Uh, multiplication is commutative. So you can think of these all as being in one big fraction. The top is sine AX times A. The bottom is BX times A. And then I just change the order of multiplication. I bring the B over here, I bring the A over there. And now this piece, I can make the substitution Z equals AX and observe that as X goes to zero, z goes to zero, two. So this would become lim z to zero, sine z over z times a over b. And then that first piece there is gonna be one times a over b. And that is indeed a over b. Um, and there are more, you can be more general than this. Um, you swap the sine for a tangent, something very similar happens because tangent is sine over cosine. And the cosine of zero is one. I don't care about the cosine. He doesn't actually have any effect on the limit. Um, so there are all sorts of ways you can generalize that limit. Um, and the problems in your homework are meant to help you start to spot those patterns. So yeah, Pedro, there definitely are patterns there. Um, limits that look like this in general will always come out to A over B. It's important that the X is going to zero, right? I want to make that really clear. If this was the limit as x goes to 1, or the limit as x goes to pi, or the limit as x goes to infinity, all this shit's out the window. This only makes sense at 0, because that's where our special trig limit is. Um, but it does work well there. Thank you. Right. Uh, there are a couple questions in chat that I want to address. So um, Fabrice, I hope you're feeling a little bit more comfy with the algebra steps there. And then Luke, yes, of course, absolutely. So the reason I, I like free response on the test so much is is precisely because I can give you partial credit. So the, the free response questions are worth 10 points um, each, and I will go in there and design a rubric. You know, if you get to this step, you get five points. If you get to this step, you get seven points. Um, and that's, that's how I'll be grading those. So with, it'll take me about a week to get through and mark all the free response questions after you guys take the tests, and each free response will be scored out of 10 points. Um, usually, I used to do these out of five points, but there's something with Canvas quizzes, the way they're structured, that it just makes it easier if I, if I make them out of 10 points. And so I doubled the point value of all the questions to get everything to come up to 100, and, and that way it works out. So you may notice the points coming up in multiples of two. Like, it'll be very common to see a, a two, four, six, eight or 10 point out of 10, it'll be less common to see one, three, five, seven, and nine out of 10. But yeah, the free response are gonna be marked out of 10. Um, and, uh, and there absolutely is partial credit. Okay, um, let's see. What other stuff do we wanna make sure we do some examples of before the test? These are fun. Um, sure. Yeah, these are fun too. All right. Uh, give me give me just one moment to look at some of these kind of fun um, differentiation and weird limits, and then I'll look at number four from the homework. Both of these are problems that are going to become useful when you get to, to Calc 2, um, specifically towards the end of Calc 2, where you want to find really high derivatives, like not the first or second derivative, not the third or fourth derivative, but like the one millionth derivative or the 99th derivative. 
Um, so this is a notation that says differentiate the thing next to me 99 times. I'm putting this here. So what we want here is the 99th derivative of the sine function. The worst way to do this is to sit down and differentiate the function 99 times. We don't want to do that. But what we should do, kind of in the in the lines of what um, what Pedro was asking about the last question, we should we should look for a pattern, right? We should see if we do a, take a few derivatives and find a pattern. So the first derivative of sine x, we know that's cos x. So the second derivative of sine x, well, it's going to be the derivative of cos x. Right? Just take the first derivative and differentiate again. And the derivative of cos x is negative sine x. The third derivative of sine x. We get that by differentiating the second derivative. So that's going to be d dx of the line above. And now this negative is a constant multiple. So we just think about, OK, well, what's the derivative of sine x? That's cos x. So the answer here is going to be negative cos x. And the fourth derivative of sine x. That's going to be what we get when we differentiate the third derivative, which was negative cos x. And the derivative of negative cos x, well, I think without the negative there, the derivative of cos x is negative sine. So negative negative sine x is just sine x. So there's a neat pattern here. What do we think the fifth derivative is? Cosine x. Yeah, we're back around to the start, right? And the sixth derivative? Negative sine x. Yeah, it would be the same as the second derivative. So every four, these repeat. Where have you seen this before? Who had a really good pre-calc class? Where have you seen something cycling every four? Yeah, Trevor? Don't you see it every in uh, imaginary numbers? Yeah, exactly. Powers of i. Powers of i cycle every four, right? i to the zero is one, i to the one is i, i squared is negative one, i cubed is negative i, and i to the four is one again. Powers of i cycle every four. There's a very deep connection between this thing going on with the derivative of sine and powers of i. You might not believe it, but well, I'll I'll see you in Calc 2 for that one. Yes, that's exactly the case, Robert. The, the fact that this cycles in powers of 4 the same way that um, powers of i cycle every 4 um, are, are deeply connected. So if I want to find the 99th derivative, of sine x, what I need to do is ask how many times does that run through this cycle? What would be the 100th derivative of sine? Yeah, here, let me let me ask this first. This will be a little easier. One hundred is divisible by four, isn't it? One hundred is twenty-five times four. So if I wanted to differentiate the sine function one hundred times, that means I'm going to run through this loop twenty-five times. So if I want to diff, so did everybody follow that? So what is the one hundredth derivative of sine? Sine x. Yeah, sine. So what's the 99th derivative? Negative cosine. Perfect. Right? You just have to figure out where you are in this cycle. 
if the 100th derivative puts you at the same spot as the fourth derivative in this cycle, then the 99th derivative puts you at the same spot as the third derivative in this cycle. Cool shit, right? Um, now there's also something neat here going on with differential equations. If you take the sine function and you differentiate it twice, you get the negative of the sine function. So another way to express this is to say that sine satisfies the differential equation y plus y double prime equals zero, or y double prime equals negative y. All right, this has been fun. Let's try the other one. This one's a little bit, this one's a little bit tougher. I want to find the 35th derivative of x sine x. And again, I, I really don't want to differentiate 35 times, but I will differentiate a few times and look for patterns. So we want to find d35, dx 35 of x sine x. So we should start by saying what the first derivative of x sine x is. This is a product rule, right, with a trig function. So this is going to be the derivative of x times sine x left alone plus x left alone times sine x primed, which is 1 times sine x plus x times cos x. which means my second derivative is the derivative of this and the derivative of sine x, that's cos x, Plus, here I will need a product rule, right? I should, yeah. So here I still need to differentiate the x cos x, which is a product rule thing. So this is cos x plus. Now, and here I do my little product rule, the derivative of x, leave cos x alone, plus leave x alone, differentiate cos x, that's cos x plus, this is going to be 1 times cos x plus x times, the derivative of cos x is x times negative sine x. So this is 2 cos x minus x sine x. And we can look up here at the first derivative, look down here at the second derivative, and see if we start to notice any patterns. I say we do one or two more and see where we're going. Is everybody comfy with this second derivative calculation? The sine x here differentiates to cos x. And then I didn't want to do the product rule all here in one step. I wanted to, to break it down so you guys could see where it's coming from. but. It's just the derivative of this plus the derivative of this. The derivative of this is this. The derivative of this is this thing primed. And then in the next line here, we go ahead and do the product rule. Let's do one more. The third derivative of x sine x is the derivative of 2 cos x minus x sine x, which is already like this, 2 cos x primed minus x sine x primed. And I can be smart here. Um, the x sine x primed that's the first derivative. 
So instead of recalculating that, I can just use what I know it is. The derivative of two cos x is negative two sine x, because the derivative of cos x is negative sine x, minus parentheses. Now the derivative of x sine x is something I've calculated earlier. That's sine x plus x cos x. So rather than recalculating it, I'll just copy it down from where I calculated it before. So I'm going to have negative 2 sine x minus sine x. We'll have to distribute this negative number. So that's going to be negative 3 sine x and then minus x cos x. We'll do one more, but we're starting to see a pattern, right? The first derivative here, I've got one sine x plus x cos x. Second derivative, I've got two cos x minus x sine x. Third derivative, I've got negative three sine x minus x cos x. So it looks like this number increases by one each time. Looks like the function attached to that number cycles through the derivatives of sine. And I don't really have to do much fresh calculation here because all the pieces I need I've done before. So this is ddx of negative three sine x minus x cos x. I wanna differentiate that whole thing. The derivative of negative three sine x is easy and the derivative of x cos x, that's something I, I have elsewhere on the page. So I'll write it like this. This is negative three sine x primed minus x cos x primed. And to save time, I'm gonna look elsewhere on the page to see if I've done the x cos x derivative somewhere else. I have, right, right here. The derivative of x cos x, x cos x primed, is cos x minus sine x, um, minus x sine x. So this is going to be negative three cos x minus, the x cos x primed here is cos x minus x sine x. And if I combine my like terms, distributing this negative, I'll have negative four cos x plus x sine x. So I do see a pattern, right? I can um, condense this information somewhere. The first derivative dx of x sine x. That first derivative was sine x plus x cos x. The second derivative, d2 dx squared of x sine x was 2 cos x minus x sine x d3 dx cubed, the third derivative of x sine x was minus 3 sine x minus, where are we here, minus 3 sine x minus x cos x. And then the fourth derivative Uh, was minus four cos x plus x sine x. So d4 dx to the four x sine x was minus four cos x plus x sine x. 
All right. Here's what we've calculated. Yeah, that's the question. So what is the pattern? What do we think the fifth derivative would look like? Would it be five sine x plus um, negative x cosine x? Yeah, let's so um, let's think first about each of the pieces here. It looks like any of these derivatives, you're going to have some number and then sine or cosine and then some num uh, x times sine or cosine here, and the sines, SIGNs, in between blink back and forth, and the SIGNs over here blink back and forth. I'll go ahead and do the calculation for the fifth derivative. I'm going to do it over here so we don't, we don't clutter our work here, and then I'll copy it down over there. d5 dx to the 5 x sine x is d dx of all of this, negative four cos x plus x sine x. The negative four cos x is going to become positive four sine x. And the derivative of x sine x, we know is sine x plus x cos x. So this is gonna be five sine x plus x cos x. So that's the fifth derivative, d5 dx to the 5 x sine x is 5 sine x plus x cos x. So what's happening here is that this, the positive and negative signs in the first column here, these blink back and forth every two terms. Positive, positive, negative, negative, positive, positive, negative, negative. And the same is going on here. It started with a positive, but you've got positive, negative, negative, positive, positive, and then the next two terms would be negative, negative. So we can conjecture d6 dx to the 6 x sine x, what are we going to have? So this is plus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus. This goes sine, cos, sine, cos, sine. So the next one here would be positive 6 cos x, just looking at the first pieces, right? The number goes up by 1, and it blinks back and forth from plus to minus every two terms. It would be minus x sine x. Good. So these last two terms here had been positive, which means it's time for them to go back to negative. And then this goes x cos x sine x cos x sine x cos x sine. So here there isn't so much a cycle, right? Um, it's not like the whole derivative cycles, but you've got some patterns. So, we want the 35th derivative. What do we think we're going to have here? Well, there's definitely going to be a 35 and then either a sine or a cosine. And then we'll have one of a plus or a minus, and then an x sine x or an x cos x here. So where are we going to be in that pattern when we get to 35? Wouldn't it be 35 sine x? And then... Mm -hmm. We're definitely going to have, so the first blank is going to be a sine x. Would you, can I ask you to share with us how you knew that, Madi? You're correct. 
Uh, because all the odds were sign. Good, right. Look at this. The first derivative here is a sign there. The third derivative here is a sign there. The fifth derivative here is a sign there. All of the odd derivatives have this first blank as a sign. And this is because odd derivative, All right? Because we're on an odd number derivative. What about the SIGN sign? Is that first term there gonna be positive or negative? Yeah, we're getting close. It's something like that, Fabrice. So uh, 35 sine x is correct for sure. And then I'd like to know whether this should be a positive 35 or a negative 35 and how I can tell. Look at these first four. First derivative and second derivative are positive. Third derivative and fourth derivative are negative. So it depends on where you fall in this, again, kind of cycle of four thing. Trevor says it's positive. Why would it be positive? How many multiples of four are there beneath 35? Yeah, eight times four is 32, right? So that would be 32 is the same as as starting back up at the at the start. So 33 would be like one, 34 would be like two, and 35 I think would be here, right? Would be back to negative. Hmm. So have you guys heard of modular arithmetic? This is really the nice way to do this. This is a mod four thing. Um, the first derivative should, uh, let's see, so. You can even count if you wanted to, but it's, it's going to be unpleasant. I conjecture that this is going to be uh, negative because, like Trevor says, so 8 times 4 is 32. We want to go 3 more out to 35. Um, so 32 should be the same as this guy for the purposes of the signs in front here. So we need to walk three more down to get from 32 to 35. So I'm thinking this will be a negative 35. I'll leave that like this for now. Let's jump over to the other term here. We know this is gonna be X times either sine or cosine. Now what patterns do we have here? The first derivative has x cos x, second x sin x, third x cos x, fourth x sin x. Yeah, because all of the odd derivatives here have a cosine. And 35th derivative is certainly odd. And then here we need to sort out plus or minus. And this again is skipping in patterns of two. So the first one is positive, then we have two negatives, then two positives, then we'd have two negatives. So the seventh derivative would be negative. The eighth and ninth derivatives, this would be positive. The 10th and 11th derivatives would be negative. The 12th and 13th would be positive. So we need to sort out whether this is going to be a plus or a minus also. Um, is there a clean way to do this? We got to reduce things mod four is really what we need to do. We need to find out where we live in this cycle. Um, so one plus two minus three minus four plus five plus. Uh, so again, if we reduce 35 mod four, um, two, so we find ourselves at the third thing in there. So I think that this should match the third. I think these should both be negative. I think both plus and minus should match row three because 
we're after the 35th derivative and 35 is 32 plus three. And 32 is a multiple of four. This is four times eight plus three. And we know every four, these cycle back around. So every four, I don't care. I kind of start back over, right? So if this was a 34 plus one, that would be the same as being here. If this was a multiple of four plus one, that would be the same as being here. Multiple of four plus two is the same as being here. Multiple of four plus three is the same as being here. So these should match row three. So I think both of these should be negative. Is that making sense? These are fun problems and we can crunch it out. We can ask what is the actual 35th derivative? Um, but this is sort of the logic, right? Every four, these repeat just like the powers of i. And again, the reason there is, is because there's an intimate connection between powers of i and derivatives of sine and cosine. A fun tool for things like this Wolfram alpha. So we can ask for the 35th derivative. Oh, no shit. What is that? Both negative. Good. Were you able to follow this logic? This one's definitely harder than the first, but it's the same sort of thing. The logic here being we know that these signs cycle in, in a pattern of fours. And we know that 35 is some number, we've, uh, is a multiple of four plus some number. So at 32, it's like you're back around to starting. You haven't, it's like, it's like you haven't done anything. So because our number here, 35, is 32 plus 3, let's say multiple of 4 plus 3, all of the signs, all of the patterns here should match the third row. All right? This would be like uh, 32 plus 1, 33. 32 plus 2, 34. 32 plus 3, 35, which is what I wanted. So it's not negative? It is negative. Yeah, both terms are negative. So why isn't it negative 32 minus 3? Um, could I ask, could you just repeat the question? I'm sorry. So if it's like negative 35, then why at the bottom isn't it negative 32 minus three? Oh, well, the number here is, is totally separate, right? The number that's in front there is just the number of derivatives you've taken, right? The second derivative had a two there. The third derivative had a three there. The fourth derivative had a four there. So the 35th derivative will have a 35 here. That was a pattern we recognized earlier. What I was trying to figure out is the plus and minus signs. And the pattern we noticed for the plus and minus signs is that they run through in cycles of four. So if I can figure out where I am in that cycle of four, right, plus, plus, minus, minus, this is your cycle of four for the signs, or plus, minus, minus, plus, cycle of four for the signs here. If I can figure out where I am in that cycle of four, just regarding the positives and negatives, not regarding the numbers, that will tell me whether to take this to be positive or negative and this to be positive or negative. Down here, the 35th derivative, I take the, I take the derivative 32 times and then three more times after that. When I take the derivative 32 times, I will have run through that cycle of four eight times. So that's like the 32nd derivative would have a minus in the first part and a plus in the second part. And then the 35th derivative is going to start, or sorry, the, the 32nd derivative will have a minus here and a plus here because 32 is a multiple of four. And then the 33rd derivative would have a plus here and a plus here because that's starting back over in that cycle. The 34th derivative would have a plus here and a minus here because that's the second place in that cycle, two past a multiple of four. And then the 35th derivative would have a minus here and a minus here because that is three past a multiple of four. 
Okay, I got it. Thank you. It's, it's very strange, but it's fun. If you're curious about what's going on in the background here, this is all about what's called modular arithmetic. And to people who are interested in number theory, it is a big, big deal. Also sometimes called clock arithmetic. Um, Trevor asks, so 36 would end on the fourth term, but it is a multiple of four. Yeah, exactly. So the fact that 36 is a multiple of four and 36 would have the same sign patterns as the fourth row is precisely what we're saying. Uh, Luke asks a separate question. Where will we find the study guide work feedback? Will it be on WebAssign, email, or Canvas? So you, you're going to submit your work for the study guide here in Canvas, right? Study guide one, you'll come in here and you'll submit your work here. And then I'm going to come in and use the speed grader to annotate and make comments. So you'll find the comments on your written work in Canvas. You're going to submit the work in Canvas and you'll find the comments in Canvas. You should get an, excuse me, an email or a notification when I come in there and make those comments. It'll say like, you know, so-and-so has commented, Professor Filesticker has commented on your work. The study guide questions themselves are in WebAssign. So you'll, you'll find the questions in WebAssign, complete the assignment in WebAssign, write down your work as you do that, and then submit that work here in Canvas. Okay. What day is the exam on? Sorry. Next Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, Wednesday the 10th. And is it apt to do at a certain time? Yes. So the test, this is a synchronous class. Um, so the, the exams have to be done during class time. So okay. next Wednesday, I'll post an announcement with, with detailed instructions. But next Wednesday, instead of coming to our normal class meeting, um, you're going to use your phone to navigate to a Zoom meeting, and I'll post the announcement in here, just like you do for normal class, and you're going to use your phone for that. And then on your computer, you're going to come into assignments, and you're going to launch the exam. So you'll be doing the exam on your computer, and you'll have Zoom open on your phone. Um, Zoom will be like pointed at your desk, your hands, so I can see your writing, I can see your paper and everything. And then Honor Lock will be running on your computer while you take the exam here. Okay, so thank you. It will only be an hour and 15 minutes. Yep, 75 minutes. Okay. I think a minute ago, who did we have? We had somebody ask for a homework problem, right? We want to look at number four. Is that on homework five? Here, right? Yeah, this is a fun one. Theta, cos theta, sine theta. So this is a product rule thing, right? Clearly these are three functions multiplying each other. And I know how to differentiate each one of them on their own. Um, but if I wanna differentiate the product, I need the product rule. The kind of catch here is that I've got three things, not two things. So you have to choose how you wanna group them. I'll group them like this. I'll call this one of my pieces and I'll call this one of my pieces. So f primed of theta, the derivative of this function, following the product rule, I differentiate the first thing and leave the second alone. And I'm just going to write it out in the prime notation. So that's theta sine theta, all primed time. Oh, sorry, theta, god damn it. Sorry, f primed of theta. So my first piece, I differentiate the first piece and I leave the second piece alone. So that's theta cos theta primed times sine theta, the derivative of the first times the second left alone, plus, now I leave the first piece alone. 
So that's theta cos theta left alone. And I multiply that by the derivative of the second. This piece is easy. This piece though requires another product rule. So because there are three functions multiplying here, we kind of have to use the product rule twice. There's no getting away from that. If I want to differentiate theta cos theta, I have to differentiate theta and leave cos theta alone, and then add that to what I get when I leave theta alone and differentiate cos theta. Now all of that is still being multiplied by this sine theta. And then I still have these two other pieces here. I've got my theta cos theta times sine of theta prime. So this is what we get when we write everything out in the prime notation. So this requires two product rules. Now we're ready to actually do the differentiation. The derivative of theta is one, so that's one cos theta. And then the derivative of cos theta here is negative sine theta. So this is going to be minus theta sine theta. All of that is being multiplied by the sine theta here. And then I have theta cos theta times the derivative of sine theta, which is cos theta. So this would be a fine, for example, on a test, you could leave this as this. Um, but it's nice to, to clean this up because this does clean up quite a bit. I'm going to have cos theta times sine theta. So I'm distributing the sine theta minus theta sine theta times sine theta, which is theta sine squared theta. And then here I have plus theta cos cos, which is plus theta cos squared theta. So this is our derivative and it requires two product rules. So this is a fun problem. So this is the one you wanted to see Fabrice? Is it possible to do number 16? Sure. Uh, before I move away from this, any questions on this guy? Everybody sees how we're doing this, right? This is like my first function. This is like my second function. So I've got the derivative of the first times the second plus the first left alone times the derivative of the second. And then within this, I need another product rule. All right, uh, we want to see number 15. Sorry, 16. 16, sure. So here they ask us to express this, um, explain like how this is a composite function. So like what's my inner, what's my outer? Uh, and then they want us to find the derivative of the whole thing. So this, the notation they use here for the inner and outer is a little bit, a little bit weird. Um, they tell us why is the tangent of pi x, identify the inner which they're calling u equals g of x and the outer um, y equals f of u, and then find the derivative. And there's a lot of mixing of notation here. So the first part they ask us, what is g of x comma f of u? And you guys remember the other day when we were doing these chain rule things for the first time, I would write like the inner and the outer I would say the inner here is u equals, well, what is, look at this function here. What is my inner and what is my outer? For this guy, what's the inner and what's the outer? 
B is pi x. Good. So u is pi x. And my outer? Tan u. Tan u. Yeah, I would say f of u is tangent u. Um, so they, they're saying, well, u is g of x, and y is f of u. So they just want me to tell them what's the inner, that's what goes in the first thing here. So this first guy would be pi x, and f of u is tan u. Writing it as an ordered pair like this feels a little bit silly, but there is a sense in which it, it works, right? Like input, comma, output. That's how we think about graphs of functions usually. So that's what they're doing. Now, if I want to find the derivative, dy dx, I know that this is, this is what I get by taking the derivative d dx of tangent pi x, because that's the thing I'm trying to differentiate. So the way I encourage you to think about this, remember, is that little mnemonic, differentiate the outside. leaving the inside alone. Then multiply by the derivative of the inside. That's really what the chain rule says. Differentiate the outside, leaving the inside alone. Then multiply by the derivative of the inside. So the outside here is tangent. So if I differentiate the outside, leaving the inside alone, I'll get secant squared of pi x. That's differentiating the outside, leaving the inside alone. And then I need to multiply by the derivative of the inside. And I'll just write that schematically as pi x primed. Everybody comfy with this step? So then the derivative of pi x, that's all I need to finish this up. If you differentiate pi x, it's just like differentiating 2x or 7x or 10x. The x differentiates to 1, and the constant multiple comes along for the ride. So this is secant squared pi x times pi. Questions on this one? We have about five more minutes here. I'd be happy to look at any particular homework problems or any um, concepts from the text. Implicit differentiation and all that is going to wait until after the after exam one. I don't want to dump too much of that stuff on you right now. Yeah, number eight. Let's finish with that. So I'll remind you guys, um, there is not going to be an office hour this afternoon. I'll do an extra office hour next week, but um, but today I am in a rush to move out of this house. So I gotta gotta get some of that stuff done. If you do have burning questions that you wanted to talk about in office hours, or something you wanted to talk about privately rather than in front of the rest of the class here, I totally understand. Just send me a Canvas message and I'll work with you. We'll find a way, um, either with a, an extra meeting sometime over the weekend, or uh, we can just communicate through email. Here, they give us a function, f of x equals 3 e to the x cos x, and they ask for the first and second derivatives. So f primed, we know, is the first derivative. f double primed is the second derivative. It's what we get by differentiating the first derivative again. So f primed, the first derivative, we get by applying d dx to the original function. And there's a bunch of ways to do this. Um, I would, just for simplicity, say we think it's a definitely a product rule. And I would take that for my first and that for my second. So I'll have the derivative of the first times the second plus the first 
times the derivative of the second. That's the product rule. Now the derivative of three e to the x is three e to the x, right? The three is a constant multiple. He just comes along for the ride. And the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. And now the derivative of cos x here is negative sine x. And to make life nice in the second derivative, so I'm going to have to differentiate this again to get f double primed. You notice I would need to use two product rules. And uh, fuck that noise, right? I don't, if I can avoid using two product rules, I would like to avoid it. So I'm going to factor 3e e to the x out. And what's left is going to be cos x minus sine x. And by doing this algebra in f primed, I escape the need for a second product rule because now I've got this thing, which I know how to differentiate, times this thing, which I know how to differentiate. So f double primed is what I get by applying ddx to this thing. And again, I need to think of it as one function times another function. So here's my first function and my second function. Like this. So when I jump in with my product rule, I'll have the derivative of the first, so that's three e to the x primed times the second left alone, cos x minus sine x left alone plus 3e to the x left alone times the derivative of the second, which is cos x minus sine x all primed. Hang on, kitty, you're okay. So that's the product rule set up for my second derivative. And it really is nice to factor this 3e to the x out like I did here because it saves us from having to do two product rules. If you just jump in and say, okay, I'm gonna differentiate this as it is, you need a product rule for this piece and you need a product rule for this piece. It gets a little messy. But by factoring it, I'm able to think of it as just a single product rule thing. So this is three e to the x, the derivative of that, times cos x minus sine x left alone plus 3e to the x times the derivative of cos x is negative sine x. And the derivative of sine x uh, is cos x. So minus sine x will differentiate to minus cos x like this. And this is good. We could stop here if we wanted to. But there's actually a lot of cancellation that occurs. You can see this two different ways. You can distribute everything out and then combine like terms, or you could factor again. You could factor 3e e to the x out. Let's see what happens if I factor 3e e to the x out again. Then in here I'd have cos x minus sine x minus sine x minus cos x. Right, when I pull this term out here, this is left and this is left. The cosines eat each other up and I just have negative two sine x. So this is three e to the x times negative two sine x. And when you multiply three and negative two, you get negative six. So it's negative six e to the x sine x like this. And that's job done here. All right, and that does bring us right up to the end of class time. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and cut it here. Um, again, I'm sorry, no office hour today. I'll, I'll make an announcement um, 
and then we will do an, an extra office hour sometime next week, early next week, to make up for it before the exam. Um, if you do have anything that you're dying to talk to me about, please uh, just send me a Canvas message. And remember to work on that study guide and get those things submitted, your written work for the study guide submitted as soon as you can. So I can get in there, make some comments, and, and hopefully help prepare you a little bit more for next week's test. Remember, exam one is going to be next Wednesday. Um, our next class, Monday, will just be all review. So please bring questions you want to work on. Um, I won't dump anything fresh on you between, between now and the test. So Monday is going to be all review. Bring your questions, and uh, that's it. I'll see you guys next time, okay? All right. Take care, gang.